Thank you all. It's my pleasure to be here. It's my honor as well. Thank you for, for the, all the organizers here for helping me out and supporting. Thank you, Marina, for your support. Um, my paper addresses tracing the impact and addressing the visual aesthetics of calotype in colonial India. India is a major, I, you must be knowing that India till 1870s, we have calotype there. So until now, it has been in practice in India. The arrival and adaptation of photography in India had a purpose to serve. It brought the oriental fantasy alive in the front of the European world. The far away exotic oriental land unveiled itself through photographic images, which retained and completed its visual authenticity. These, rep these representations would further acquire a place in museums, commercial albums, and personal memories. It was a time when human vision was considered to be the synonymous to the neutral eye of the camera. In addition, photography strived to make distances closer and information more reliable. It also worked well as a support for the colonizers to refine their role. As the rulers, it was a tool that enforced the ongoing process of recording, mapping, and documentation. The history of Indian photography started concurrently with the inception of photography in Europe around 1839, but proliferated only during 1850s. The proliferation was a result of various circumstances. The earliest known photographic images from India are either daguerreotypes or uh, prints from calotype. Apart from the introduction of wet plate collodion, which was invented in 1851, to the Indian subcontinent, the practice of calotype process lasted well into 1870s. It contrast to other parts of the world, calotype gained a huge popularity in the Indian subcontinent because of its compatibility with the environment and the feasibility of the process. As Alexander Greenlaw, a prominent British calotypist working in India wrote, quote, I have used this process for years in India and find it most simple. I obtained the first prize for my pictures, so taken at the next exhibition with cleanliness, it is certain. Calotype was largely adapted by European photographers who traveled across India for documenting and recording. With calotype, the images could be captured when the sensitized paper is dry, thereby often revealing the photographer from the onerous task of carrying the entire darkroom setup to the site and permitting the artist previously unattainable levels of mobility and freedom. It was far easier to carry than glass plates. The process gained momentum in India as being the earliest photographic process, allowing the logical illumination of the Western quest for mimesis in the visual representation. Early, earliest referred photographer from the India is John McCosh. He was a Scottish, uh, he was Scottish army surgeon who chose photography along with poetry as a hobby while he was recruited in India and Burma during 1848 and 1852 respectively. He participated in the Second Anglo-Sikh War in Punjab, India, although referred as war photographers who adopt, deployed calotype process for photographs, his photographs from Punjab never directly projected the grotesqueness of wars. His early photographic subjects are preliminary of his fellow officers, important figures of the administration, their wives and children. His photographs were intended to record memories of individuals rather than event. The paper negatives were printed as sol prints and portraits majorly are close frames capturing the individuals, either in strict profile or in three quarter pose before a white background so that the individuals are well identified. More, a more tightly framed composition is seen when it comes to portraits by him. He used paper negatives, a large lens, and bright light in Indian subcontinent combined to reduce the time for exposure. And this allowed him to achieve less contrived pose for his subjects. In his images, one can observe the use of rendering, which, uh, rendering which he must have done in the negative itself. Uh, you can see there's a, the hand, there's a rendering done by him. So the size of the early images he took were mostly for quarter size view cameras. In later years, during 1850s, the size McCosh typically printed was 20 centimeter into 22 centimeter. He gave directives for the types of camera suitable for Indian subcontinent. He also recommended in the advice of officers in India that photographers should select a specific French paper for calotype. 
McCosh photography indicates that he initially in intended to record his immediate surrounding as collections of memories. He retired from his post in 1856, after which a single album was assembled in 1859. With all his photographs, there are 300 prints from calotype, although 31 were from collodion negatives. The photographs by him from Punjab are known to be the earliest and probably the rarest document of its time. Makosh photographs is most in instance as have a unique cut at the four corners of the negatives, framing and resulting in the prints carefully trimmed to retain a defining black border. Um, that's the, on the left side, on to your left side is another image by Ahmad Ali Khan. Ahmad Ali Khan was an, uh, a photographer from Lucknow. He was practicing in 1850s. It's almost and comparable to the other photographer I was mentioning. Another photographer, as well as lithographer, Frederick Fabe, active in Indian subcontinent, extensively practiced calotype process and produced typically charismatic hand-colored salt prints. He is considered as a prolific calotypist who has produced the first extensive photographic documentation in Calcutta and Madras. His name has been mentioned in Photography in Madras, an illustrated Indian journal of arts published in 1852. In this journal, it is also mentioned that Mr. Fabe had completed at least seven to 800 views of Calcutta. The photographs by him project a documentation of the important place, streets, and architecture of colonial India. In the majority of the composition, he has placed human figures preliminary to give proportions of scale. It also creates a visual entry point for the viewer, viewers. Frederick Fabe at, attentively documented the surrounding, whereas John Murray, these are Frederick, these are his works. Uh, John Murray, a Scottish civil surgeon employed by East India Company during 1833, focused primarily on Mughal architecture of Agra. Murray extensively practiced calotype from 1850s until the late 1860s, despite their arrival and document, uh, domination of the other photographic techniques. He is acknowledged for his uh, large, successful wax paper negative works, the size are almost 38 into 46 centimeters, and the extensive panoramic view that he produced by stitching prints together. There are three prints that has been stitched together to form a huge work. John Murray opened up the boundaries related to color type, further stretching its limitation to achieve enigmatic visuals. He meticulously recorded the architectural details while re retaining a visual sensitivity. Murray, during his visit to Britain in 1857, took along with him a portfolio of 400 wax paper negatives, and during September 1857, the London-based publisher, J. Hogarth, made the prints available to the people, either individual or in the sets, entitled Photographic Views in Agra and its Vicinity. These photographs were combined by the, accompanied by descriptive notes in the separate booklet. He was undoubtedly a master in his paper negatives, show elaborate retouch and edit skills. For example, the skies and the negatives are blackened out, thereby attaining a flat white sky, which is in turn brought forward the necessary architectural details. Contrast has also been achieved. The blackening of the sky in the negative also helped to uh, properly expose the subject of the architecture. Moore's application for yellow in the negatives, where the dark areas inside the architecture needed illumination, have been applied with utmost accuracy. This editing demands an immense understanding of the play of light on the surface. Murray also stationed human figures in composition. In compositions, uh, they, have, they seem frozen along with the architecture itself. He explored the exotic grandeur which would have appreciated by the colonial gaze. Murray's huge photographs are remarkable for two reasons. It's phenomenal composition size in terms of technicality of the process, and second, in terms of capturing the true architectural grandeur. The photographs from Agra by Murray are reorganized as the earliest um, photographs of India showed in England. His subject selection concerns the visual beauty, the need of visual information to please and reinforce the colonial taste. In contrast to Murray, when we encountered the works by Robert and Harriet Tyler, These, uh, this particular work is by John Murray. The next one is by Raja Deen Dayal, the Indian photographer who was working. 
along my side. You can just compare the two photographs, the same spot, but how an Indian photographer has taken it, it has an usual uh, visual narrative into it. They have, uh, uh, he has not omitted the extra narration, whereas in John Murray's case, he has stationed human figures and make all unnecessary events. He had omitted the unnecessary events which were doing. So it's Dean Dale's photograph, and this one is John Murray's photograph. And Robert and Harriet Tytler. Um, works by Harriet and Robert Tytler, a sense of personal record of their memory and experience sensation is presented. Unlike Moore's photography, this, their stress is on recording of for self by preserving the prime spot related to sepoy mutiny. Their works primarily are post-sepoy revolt sites of conf on conf uh, conflict. Sorry. <clears throat> they photograph the empty spaces uh, of Ghat at Kanpur where the British civilians have lost their lives or the Humayun tomb where the king was captured. These photographs are present in the empty spaces which hold within them a larger narration. As compared by the post-colonial theorist Zahid Chaudhary, unlike, I'm quoting it, unlike Felice Bieto, theatrical photography, the titler's work asks us to find in these photographs a living historicity. Although these photographs capture only the blank spaces after the event, they work as a backdrop on which the narration of the event can be imagined. They are credited for producing 500 large paper negatives associated with the uprising. The photographers like Murray, Robert, and Harriet Tytler concentrated on the northern half of India and selected subjects related to the great uprising and also to architecture. However, in contrast to these photographers was Alexander Greenlaw. Robert and Harriet Tatler's photographs. These are clicked by them. You can understand this huge uh, Kutub Minar technically was not possible, so it's like panorama view. They have to maintain a certain distance, so technically also it's very important. Robert and Harriet Tatler's photograph after the Sepoy mutiny. This is Felice Bieto's photograph. I was talking about the theatrical aspect. Uh, most of the historians think that when he fell Sebeto came, this, uh, the skeletons which are lying was not there. He had, he had made them, he had created the scene so he could uh, get an authentic view of the uprise. So this is Felice Beto's. Robert and Harry Tatler's calotype negative from Lucknow. Alexander Greenlaw's work, which I'm about to talk. The photographers, uh, uh, Greenlaw was from England, who is known for his thorough recording of Vijayanagara ruins in Hampi. Alexander Greenlaw is also credited for simplifying the process of calotype, re reducing it to its essential in order to cope up with the heat of India. It's very important uh, calotype is for us because he has reduced the time span and, and worked well in India. His works in India can be traced from 1855 onwards until 1870s. In 1856, he produced a sensitive, intensive uh, series of large format 16 into 18 and 16 into 20 inches images of paper showing the ruins of Vijayanagara. It is also known that he ordered a special camera from Richard William Thomas in London in order to cope up with Indian heat. The other major related, uh, name related to the practice of calotype in India these are works of Alexander Greenlaw from Vijayanagara, the negative. The other major name related to the practice of calotype in India is Linear Strip, who chose a career in Army of East India Company and was recruited in India in 1839. He started taking photographs from 1855 in India. He was appointed the official photographer for the government of Madras from 1857 to 1860s. In 1855, he presented 68 photographs printed from, mass from massive 12 into 14 inch wax paper negatives. His images are considered to be much more refined and delicate in comparison to Greenlaw's images. Greenlaw's images present boldness, freedom in visual weaving, and a contrast image e qualities attain. Alexander Greenlaw's work. You can see he is sitting up there, so he might have placed the camera in front, set the time, and he has run up to the architectural uh, structure, and he sat there for a minute. So it was almost uh, mid time he has taken. It was great. So it's linear strips work. 
this is the positive of this negative. The process, I'm now coming to the end and I'm uh, about to say you that in today's world also we are practicing calotype. The process of calotype, we, with the arrival of other photographic method laws, its presence in the sub Indian subcontinent. It is now almost a gap of 177 uh, years getting revived in India. You might be surprised to know that calotype in India, although in small pocket, um, is reviving with its possibilities. My connection and my interest towards the early photographic process was initiated with my involvement with a photographic studio established in Shantiniketan, India. This is a research studio called Studio Goppo, uh, which practiced and experiments on the 19th century historical photographic process. The process of calotype for artists, this is the studio, Mm, the process of calotype for artists like Arpan Mukherjee, who initiated his studio, now become a medium through which he readdresses and conceptualizes his work. He conceptualizes his selection of the medium. This is his work. He conceptualizes his selection of medium with his content. He believes in the process of making of an image rather than the final product. The world is now rediscovering and readdressing the lost charm of the long lost photographic processes and presenting a varied spectrum of the visual language in making. Thank you all.